As followers of Christ, we're inspired by stories of peoples whose lives are unstoppable. People who overcome obstacles in their way, whether they're physical obstacles, sickness, disease, disability, mental, uh, mental struggles, anguish, uh, mental uh, illness, relational issues, they get abandoned, hurt, injured, abused, political, uh, they live out their life over against a hostile uh, political environment, or financial, they serve the Lord in the face of just abject poverty. People who overcome these obstacles and come out on the other side, that they come out stronger, wiser, more dedicated, and even counterintuitively, they come out more joyful in Christ than they were before. These are the kinds of people that inspire us. This is why for many of us, right, if you've been around uh, Christ, uh, following Christ for any length of time, you're familiar with that passage in Hebrews chapter 11, what's well, often referred to as the Hall of Fame of Faith, uh, which is just a litany of, uh, of, of little accounts, little short little episodes of Old Testament figures who did astounding things in the face of daunting challenges simply because they believed that God existed and that he rewarded people who diligently sought him. So they left home and country, uh, they gave up power and riches, and uh, they even gave up their lives in belief in Christ. Now, uh, that same passage right in Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 3, gives the example of all examples of what it means to persevere and live the unstoppable life in the face of adversity, and it's the example of Christ in Hebrews chapter 12. So let me give this to you here, let me move up one, here we are. So you see this on the screen here. This is uh, the uh, uh, arch example. And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Um, just as an aside, I can't, I can't go past this one here. We, we read that passage, especially if we've grown up in the church and you're familiar with it. Um, one of those ones that people, pastors in particular, love to speak on. Uh, but it's hard to, to really get inside the emphasis of that unless you understand deeply who Jesus is and was as the Son of God who gave up uh, the privileges and standing that he had so that he could take into himself the sufferings uh, and the sin of humankind, which is uh, beyond our ability to imagine. And then on a human level to understand what exactly happened on the cross, which he did on our behalf. So here's Christ as the arch example. But if we move forward, even in time, we can tell countless stories. And some of you might have your favorite stories of saints who looked to Jesus and lived an unstoppable life. Uh, and often in the face of just heartbreaking and just extremely difficult uh, challenges. Now here, I've just selected, just that came to the, the top of my thinking just while I was thinking this week, of some of those lives, and you could probably add a host of others. And most of them are just ordinary people. And this is one of the things I want to emphasize here when we're talking about the unstoppable life. Sometimes we go to major historical figures or, or significant uh, figures who had privilege and wealth. Uh, but here are just a, a normal people who lived a faithful, powerful lives in the face of daunting obstacles. And some of you may know them. Some I chose because they're out of my own experience. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin in, in the bottom right-hand corner if you're looking at it. That's a picture of E.V. Hill and his wife. Uh, E.V. Hill, it, it was a, a, a pastor in South Central L.A. Uh, E.V. Hill is important in my life for a number of reasons. That's the summer I was working in Los Angeles, and that's where I met Rana through that ministry. Uh, so I won't credit E.V. Hill with Rana, but, but uh, I was so thankful that we met while we were ministering there in South Central L.A. And E.V. Hill, his story, if you read about his story, which I would encourage you to do, uh, E.V. Hill was uh, born in, in uh, Prairie View, Texas, uh, to a single mom with five children, uh, abjectly poor, and uh, had little or nothing. Uh, and he had a woman in his church that he called Mama, was the name of the woman, uh, and Mama came up to him one day and said to him, you're going to do great things, son, and, and you need to go to college. And where he was at, uh, um, 
Uh, black men did not graduate. Uh, most of them quit high school at 10th grade and then went and got a job uh, and worked for about two bucks an hour. And uh, uh, this woman came up to him and said, no, no, you need to finish high school. You need to be done. And when he finished high school, she came up to him and said, you need to go to school. And so she sent him off to college with a $5 bill uh, and told him and got him a, 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 a bus ticket and put him on a bus and gave him $5. And when he arrived, I think he had something like uh, two bucks left of the money. And he was standing in line uh, and he was listening as he was getting to get enrolled in college. And he heard that uh, it was going to be $83 for everything to pay for it, right? You can tell that's at a different time, right? All the Cedarville students would love to hear $83 uh, when they come there. But he was sitting there and he had $2, And so with $2, he sat there, and while he was walking up toward the line, he was there because Mama said, you need to go to school, and God's going to do great things in your life, and uh, you need to go to school, so you go. So he's standing there in line, and while he's standing in line, a man walks up to him and says, are you E.V. Hill? And he says, yes, I am. Well, we've been looking for you, and uh, we want to pay Uh, your admission costs, and we're going to give you a four-year scholarship, and we're going to give you $35 a month to live off of. And Evie Hill became a pastor and a spokesman uh, in powerful places for the gospel uh, and just inspired me in my life, overcame tremendous obstacles, and then established a church in the heart of South Central L.A. to help other people like himself find Christ and overcome obstacles in their life. Well, that's just one. I can't tell you all those stories. Uh, one up here in the top left-hand corner, most of you know Johnny Erickson Tata, uh, a girl who was running from the Lord in her early life, uh, broke her neck in a diving accident, and God reclaimed her life and turned her wheelchair, as she called it, a severe mercy from God, and turned her wheelchair into a platform to speak for the value and dignity of people all over the world uh, who have disabilities and to represent Christ in a powerful way. Um, down here in the bottom left-hand corner is a little girl by the name of Ruby Bridges. You may not know her, uh, but Ruby Bridges uh, was the little girl who was the, the, the wedge that broke segregation uh, uh, in, um, oh, I've lost the, lost the, the state now, um, in the South. Somebody help me? Was it Arkansas, 1960s? I can't remember, but... Uh, Little Ruby was interviewed by a Harvard-trained psychologist, and what they couldn't get over with Little Ruby is the resolve of her parents because she, was, she would walk to school harangued by people who would abuse her and tell her to go home and treat her as less than human, and she would walk with a smile on her face. She would wave at the people when she got up on the steps to go into the school, and she did this day after day after day. And uh, they talked to little Ruby uh, and wondered, because the, the, the psychologist was certain that, that, that deep psychological damage was happening to her and this kind of thing. And he interviewed her and he says, why, why do you smile at those people uh, um, uh, who treat you so nasty? Well, because, she said. That was her answer. They said, well, how, how, do, how, do you, how do you put up with all those people being so unkind to you all the time? She said, well, I go to church. And we're told at church that we're supposed to pray for people, even people who hate us. So I pray for them. And little Ruby uh, became the wedge to undo some of the deep darkness that she lived into as a small little girl. Well, here down in the middle on the bottom is, uh, of course, Elizabeth Elliott. Many of you know the story of her husband, Jim, going to South America uh, to try to reach some unreached uh, Indians there. uh, And his ministry was cut short. Uh, He was killed by those Indians on a beach down in a river in South America. Uh, And it's not just that uh, Elizabeth Elliot was his wife, but Elizabeth Elliot felt the same uh, uh, impelling desire to follow Jesus in the direction that they had both decided to go as a couple. And so what made it so astounding is that she went as a single woman with her child down to the the jungles of, of South America to reach the people who had murdered her husband. Right? And then right here up at the top, uh, on the right-hand corner, some of you know Stephen Curtis Chapman, right? Some of the uh, songs that he sung, many of you are familiar with the absolute family tragedy that happened in his home where his youngest adopted daughter, I believe her name was Maria, uh, ran out to greet one of his sons, Will, uh, and uh, tragically uh, fell under the car and was killed by, one of the, by his son and 
the story of their, their struggle uh, to hold on to God's goodness and grace in that moment and to move forward as a family for Will to deal with what had happened and the grief that he felt and for the family to embrace him. Uh, that's something you never get over. All right, and then right in the center is a, is a picture of Richard Wormbrand. And many of you may have heard of him. He wrote a biography, autobiography called Tortured for Christ. He was a Romanian pastor. He's now known primarily as the founder and director of Voice of the Martyrs, uh, a ministry that, that prays for and is concerned about Christians who are dying for their faith all over the world. Well, he was arrested repeatedly. Uh, he was uh, tortured over a period of three years. His wife was arrested and put in a work camp. Uh, and they faithfully served the Lord their whole life with a burden uh, in communist Romania for people who to, to come to know Christ. All right? So those are some unstoppable lives, but I just want to emphasize to you that they're just average, normal people who lived a life committed to Christ. So over these next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at 2 Timothy. And I want to, I want to help you see 2 Timothy in a way that that hopefully um, will, will in, uh, just kind of deepen the way you already see it, but maybe for some of you, give you a picture of it in a way that you haven't thought of it before. So appreciated the men reading it. Thank you, men, uh, for taking us through the book. But as we approach T Timothy here, I want to encourage you. We, we come to a book that chronicles an intimate conversation between a son and a father in the faith in the face of a dire crisis. If Within Paul's books, there's truly only one book that is truly a private correspondence. 1 Timothy and Titus are both written to authorize Timothy and Titus at their respective places of ministry to work on Paul's behalf. And so they're letters of authorization that very likely would have been read by people who doubted their authority, doubted what they were trying to do. But 2 Timothy is a private letter. Even the book of Philemon that many of you say, well, what about the book of Philemon? Well, it's written to Philemon, to Aphia, to Archippus, and to the church that meets in your house. This one is not written to Timothy, my genuine son in the faith. This is written to Timothy, my dearly beloved son in the faith. So this is a private conversation between a father and son. Paul is on death row. This is one of the prisonments he's not going to get out of. He's been condemned as a criminal by the Roman authorities. And in just a short time, he'll be led outside the walls of Rome where the executioner will sever his head from his body. And this is what he says in 4.6. If you want to look at chapter 4 and verse 6. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time of my departure is near. I'm already being poured out. And not only is his execution imminent, but he faces his execution as someone largely deserted by his friends. Right? If you're in chapter 4, look at verse 16. At my first defense, no one came to my support. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. And then very evocative of how Jesus prayed on, his own, on the cross, Lord, may it not be held against them. And as if that was not enough, in the city where he had spent most of his missionary efforts, if you chronicle Paul's travels, the longest place that he served uh, sharing the gospel was in the city of Ephesus over three years. But here in, in the kind of the core of where he had spent the bulk of his life energies, there's a mass defection from the message that he had given. So God had revealed this message to Paul of what he had done, is doing, and will do in Christ by the Spirit to restore and reclaim everything. And now it's being replaced by a foreign word, actually a word that, that Paul describes in a very kind of colorful way. He says it's been replaced by a word that's like a creeping disease. It's like gangrene. And their word of Hymenaeus and Flatus, this word that they're giving, these teachers, it's creeping into the souls of people and it's killing off their faith. It's distorting their lives. It's ruining them, right? And so this is happening. So, so right in the place where he had spent the bulk of his life labors, his life's labors, it was, it was crumbling right before his eyes, right? Now, flip back to chapter 1 if you're there in Second Timothy and come to verse 13 with me for a moment. And I want you to feel the weight of these things. 
right? The weight of what's happening here in this moment. Look at verse 13, and we'll go down to 15. What you have heard from me, Timothy, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know, Timothy, that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phagellus and Hermogenes. So there's Paul, the core of his life labors. He's coming to the end of his life. His closest friends have abandoned him, right? Timothy is, he's not mean holistically. Timothy's there, Luke's there, but, but the vast majority of the people who had been his entourage, who had worked with him in ministry, they've turned their backs on him and they've abandoned him. The very core of his life labors, the place where he had spent his energies, he had given himself and preached and taught and poured out his life for the sake of those peoples. Right there in the center, there is a, 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 a disease, a doctrinal disease that is undermining the work that he had. And here he is, moments away from having his head severed by an executioner in Rome, right? Now, if that wasn't enough, right, as we look at the letter of 2 Timothy, that's just what's happening to Paul. We haven't even talked about what's happening to Timothy yet, right? So here's Timothy, and Timothy is about to lose his mentor, okay? Now, think about this. One whom he loved as a father. Okay, some of you have lost dear people in your life people that it's hard to imagine not having them in your life. It's hard to imagine uh, all the moments that you've gone for counsel or all the time that you've just enjoyed conversation with or the fact that you knew there was somebody above you in the chain that you could just fall back on even though you had your own responsibilities, right? All those things. He's losing a father in the faith. And think about it. The man who had shown him the way of Christ. Paul was the one who had tutored him in the way of Christ. The man God had used to grow the faith of his childhood, right? Of Eunice, right? Uh, the, what was passed on to him by his mother and grandma. Lois and Eunice had passed on to him. Well, who had been the man who had grown him up in Christ? Well, had been Paul. Paul had turned him uh, and, as God's instruments into a mature, firm, compelling conviction of the truth. You know, a man who was passionate for Christ, who could be entrusted by Paul to go into this difficult circumstance that Paul had sent him into. That's the kind of man that Paul, by investing in him, right, had uh, accomplished in Timothy's life. Matter of fact, we get to chapter 3 and verse 10 a little bit later on. Paul will recite just how well they know each other and how they've been in the trenches together. And so that Timothy knows everything about Paul, not because Paul related to him by words, but because he lived with Paul and they were side by side in ministry. And so he knows whether Paul's blowing smoke or lying about what he really believes because he's been with Paul 24-7. And Paul's going to say, you know me, Timothy. So, they, so you've got this kind, and this is the kind of thing, and as uh, uh, Galen read as he got started, right, in the very beginning of the book, this is the kind of relationship that a threat to it or the possibility that it won't continue will bring the people in it to tears, right? It'll bring the people in it to tears. One of the things I, I started to see in my dad as he got older is that Every parting for my dad, and they lived about an hour and a half from here, still, my mom still does, uh, about an hour and a half from here, every parting was an occasion for tears. Every parting, right? I see that in my mom. We were down in Dallas this past weekend. Every parting is an occasion for tears. There's a sweetness about the connection that's there that the only way that you can really express how important it means to you is it just kind of wells up out of your soul and spills out your eyes, Right? Now, to top all this off, right, so Timothy's about ready to lose Paul, but Timothy's in a situation that is just absolutely difficult, right? He's been sent to Ephesus, and Paul, Paul if we, we go back to 1 Timothy to get where he's come from, Paul sent him in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 there, he said, Timothy, you've got to go to Ephesus, and, and you need to shut some people down. And the people that he's called to shut down are people who are actually teachers, they're leaders, they're pastors, Right? The church at Ephesus is not one big church, right, on the corner of the Appian Way and whatever, right? There's no church buildings. These are house churches that are meeting all over the, the city of Ephesus. 
And uh, Paul is sending Timothy because there are leaders in the church who are leading the church astray. He describes them as people who've wandered from the truth. That's how he describes Hymenaeus and Alexander in chapter 2 in 2 Timothy. They've wandered away from the truth. Right? They themselves have departed from something that they previously held. So they're people that are within the bodies of, of the church. And Paul sends Timothy. Timothy isn't called for, right? If you read like a book like 1 Corinthians, all the people at Corinth are writing Paul letter after letter and saying, Paul, the craziest things ever are happening here at Corinth, right? Paul, could you speak into this, right? We got people divided up into groups. We got crazy people doing sexually crazy things here. Paul, 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 right? Well, here in Ephesus, we have no indication that anybody sent for Paul. We just have Paul sends Timothy because he says something needs to be done. So Timothy's coming to deal with leaders, pastors, right? And he's coming to deal with people that many of the people who are in their congregations are very happy to wander away from the faith with them, right? So they're popular, and so Timothy has to step in, and then to top it all off, people are, uh, don't know for certain, but Timothy could be anywhere from his late 20s to late 30s, right? In the age, and so there's a lot that's said about Timothy, about don't let people despise your youth in 1 Timothy 4, right? Or Timothy, don't give in to youthful perspectives, right, in 2, in 2 Timothy 3, right? Those kinds of things, right? And so Timothy, maybe in his 20s, early 30s, in the ancient culture, unlike our present one, People didn't look to the youth for guidance and wisdom, okay? They don't look to the youth for guidance. There's no Greta Thunbergs in the ancient world, right? So people are not looking to the youth for guidance and wisdom about how to take care of major problems in the world. And so when you get Timothy comes in, so here's this young whippersnapper, right, who comes in the authority of Paul, and Paul's not with him, right? His mentor in the faith. He comes to a group of people who have teachers, as he talks about in chapter 4, who are, their ears are itching to give to the people what the people want to hear, and the people want to hear something that's not the gospel, and so they're happy to oblige them because they're charlatans. So Timothy is set into this kind of mess, so he's in a very difficult circumstance. Matter of fact, you, many have inferred from 1 Timothy to 2 Timothy, things have maybe even gotten worse. Because he says in chapter 1, all of Asia has left me. Now, Paul doesn't mean every single person, but he means that there's been a mass defection from the gospel. So if there was ever two guys, right, seriously, if there were ever two guys who it was, you would say, right, if you looked at them, you could understand that they would throw the towel in, right? They would give up, right? You would say, oh, my, this is impossible. They would give up, right? And the real question comes, how did they stay in the fight? How did they stay, right? Why didn't they give up, right? Why didn't they follow the majority of the people that they used to minister with and walk away from Jesus as they were doing? Why didn't they do that, right? And of all things, of Paul right here at this thing, what does he have to lose? Why did he just renounce Christ and turn back? He could probably save his life. And the question is, as we come in our series, what, what made them unstoppable in their love for Christ and their service for Christ? What made them those kinds of people? Okay? Now, what we're going to do, and this is just an overview, is we're going to try to work through the book of 2 Timothy, and we're going to try to look for the kind of advice that Paul gives to Timothy. And I, I want to give you this perspective, too. I know I've mentioned this before, but Paul is in a situation where we would all understand if Paul got kind of myopically self-obsessed, right? And, and we, could, we would understand if you got somebody who just got a cancer diagnosis or somebody who just found out some great tragedy had happened, or things along those lines, if they knew their life was coming to end just in a matter of hours or days, you might expect them to be a little panicked. You might expect them to be grasping, right? And the kind of person that everybody's reaching in to try to help them keep together because life is just kind of falling apart. Well, instead, we find the exact opposite. Here's the guy who's getting ready to be executed, and, and he's trying to guide his son in the faith through his time of crisis, and he's saying, I'm okay. Timothy, I'm okay. I want you to be okay. Right? And I know I've mentioned this before, but I can't, every time I hear this, I can't, I can't help but uh, think of Jeanette Hauser uh, in my life, uh, a, a lady who attended here. I don't know how old she was when she eventually died, but she got a, a uh, cancer diagnosis, and uh, it was going to be terminal. And I went as a, as a pastor that, that she's, she's old enough to be my grandmother, maybe my great-grandmother. 
uh, and uh, going into the hospital room to visit her. And I uh, always remember Jeanette. She was very small, petite, uh, and she was, laying, she was laying in her bed, and her bed was propped up a little bit. And uh, I came to sit down, and I didn't sit close enough to her for her liking. And so she told me, Greg, come, come over here, come over here, right? Uh, until I was right next to her, and then she reached out and grabbed my hand and pulled it through the kind of barrier on the outside of the bed. And then the whole time that we talked, she just rubbed my hand. She just rubbed my hand. Well, here was a woman that, that it was going to be a matter of days before she was going to pass from this earth. And uh, she would just say to me, Greg, I'm okay. I'm okay, Greg. I'm fine. I'm okay. But Greg, I'm worried about my babies, right? And her babies are in their 70s, right? And so she's worried about her babies because her babies are struggling with losing their mom. And she said, Greg, can you take care of my babies? Right? And you walk out of a moment like there, and you, you get the sense in a deep and profound way that Christ is sufficient for the darkest places of life. I remember being deeply, I've never forgotten that story because I came out ministered to. I don't, I don't know if I did anything for Jeanette in that moment. So what we're going to do is we walk through it like we're in a moment, right, in the church in which we're in the, mo- in the country in which we're in for many of us, right, old geezers like me, right, for many of us it seems like, you know, we're in a place where our country in many ways has lost its mind, right, the whole idea that we would think, and I just use this one example, that we would think that we should uh, allow children by their own decision to chemically castrate themselves and to to physically alter themselves for life and entrust that to them when we don't allow them uh, the right to vote. We don't allow them the right to have sexual activity because they cannot consent as children. But yet we turn around and say that there's something good and right and protective to do that for children. It just boggles my mind. And so here we are in a time where it seems in some ways that our culture has lost its mind. But, but besides the bigger picture that's impinging on us and COVID and everything else, is some of us in here are dealing with deep uh, personal crises, struggles within ourselves, with addictions, with struggles with all kinds of things that are going on in our lives. Or we've got relational issues that impinge upon our lives. And, but some of you are saying, I don't have time to worry about all the crazy things that are going on in the culture. I'm just trying to keep myself afloat in my own home. Right? And so here, what we want to look at, we're asking God to deepen our faith in Christ, to strengthen our resolve to follow him, to guide us onto the path of truth and to keep us on the path and the path that will give us life and to keep our steps from faltering along the way. We want to stand before God, and these are all phrases, right, from 2 Timothy. We want to stand before God, chapter 2, verse 15, as a workman, as someone who served Christ with no need to be ashamed when we stand before him. Because we've kept the faith, we've run our God-given course. And as we come to that passage, one of the things that Paul wants to say, each one of us has our own course. I don't have your course, you don't have mine. We're not running against each other in competition. No, you have your own life story, I have my own life story, but we all live it within God's big story. And he wants to know, he said, I've kept the course, And he looks confidently forward to the fact that God will deliver him into the kingdom in chapter 4, right? I'm not worried. I know where I'm heading, right? And so I'm moving forward today in that regard. So here, today, we're just going to begin with this short passage. So to encourage you, I I won't be far from finishing, right, Uh, as we get here. Uh, But we begin with this short passage, this opening introduction of Paul, which is his salutation. And uh, I'm I'm pausing on it as an introduction to what we're doing here because embedded in this introduction is a whole view of the world, a whole way of understanding himself, of understanding what life really is about. That shows up in the way Paul identifies himself, where he looks for resources to guide Timothy through the circumstances that he's in, right? The kind of frame of reference that determines how he lives, all of that is just embedded right here in a a very simple way in his opening introduction. Now, if you would read any letter, Paul, any letter in the first century, Paul doesn't do something astounding, like people would turn to Paul's letters over against a regular letter from anybody else in the first century world and say, hey, Paul's doing everything unique here. No, 
Paul does the same thing that everyone else would do. They would identify the author. They identify the, the person that's being written to. And often there would be some sort of greetings that would often include like a prayer wish, right? Like may Zeus give you long life, right? Something like that. Or may the gods be gracious to you. That's a very common one. Okay? But you open Paul's and he starts identifying himself not as some uh, honorable person from such and such place or not somebody who holds this particular rank or has this particular status, but no, it's Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And then when he prays, it's to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so any, any, any secular person who picked up one of Paul's letters would immediately recognize this man doesn't live within the same world I live in. He doesn't live in the same world that I live in. I, I don't see Christ as a reference point for my life. I don't pray to God the Father. I don't even have a vision of God as a father, right? In the ancient world in particular, when you think about their relationship to the gods, the gods were these, you know, superhuman beings who were busy doing their own stuff. And if it involved blessing you at some period of time, well, great, but uh, they're capricious. The next day they could curse you. The next day they could screw up your life. The whole idea that you had a God disposed toward you that was trying to bring you to the fullness of the life that you had been given was just a foreign idea to speak of them in that way. So you were busy trying to do sacrifices and rituals and everything else to, to placate these gods, to, to make them not become the eye of Mordor looking at you, right? So that you could have the blessings of these gods and you're trying to outwit them, you're trying to get mechanisms like magic to try to coerce them, all that kind of thing like that. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, right, that you live in. And largely you felt that your life was caught up in fate and there wasn't anybody really fall for you. Your life is going to be what it is. And birth was destiny. If you were born poor, that's because the gods put you there. If you were born powerful, that's where the gods put you. Right? And so all of a sudden, Paul opens up this letter and gives a whole different frame of reference. Okay? So here, I want to talk to you about a, a, a four things here that come from this passage. So if you look at it here, let's read it. And let's dig into uh, four things that seem to be a part of Paul's frame of reference here. So Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? Now my first point, the first empty space in your notes is put life in the right framework. Right? If you want to put, instead of framework, if you want to put the big picture, right, you can do that. One of the other terms is like the world view, the view of the world uh, that is correct in terms of the nature of reality. And what Paul's talking about here, he lives in a world for Paul where God reigns and God acts to accomplish his purposes. As a matter of fact, God is active in the world, right? And God is the creator of the world and God has also acted in Jesus Christ to restore a relationship with him that had been broken because of our rebellion against God. That's the world in which Paul lives. And so when he writes and he refers to Christ Jesus by the will of God, and then he prays for grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord, all of that assumes for Paul that there's a way that the world is, and matter of fact, what's central to living your life out in the world is to have a relationship with God. God and Jesus, right? So you couldn't explain Paul's life without reference to those figures because he sees himself as an apostle, as someone who's been sent by Jesus Christ to do the Father's will, right, by the will of God. And that God and Christ, in terms of sending him and in terms of, uh, of fulfilling the Father's will, well, they stand ready to resource him with everything he needs to do that will, and so when, he's, when he prays for grace, mercy, and peace, he's praying for real resources from God to accomplish the, uh, the living of his life and the faithfulness of his mission. But that's the whole framework of how he understands life. Okay? Now, I just want to contrast that framework right, with the kind of predominant framework that you find in the contemporary world in which we live. Okay, I'm always mindful when I pull out a book like this that Rick Hilliard says sometimes, Greg, you sound like a college professor giving a lecture. I don't want to do that today, right? But I want to, I want to talk about uh, the kind of predominant view of life today, of the way people look at themselves, what kind of frame that they're living in. And they don't see themselves as living in a world that has a structure, that has a purpose and a meaning. Why? Because the world just exists, 
It just happened. What kind of purpose was there for the world? There isn't any. It just exists. What kind of purpose is there for me? There isn't any. I just came to be. Right? Did somebody design you? No. Right? And so when you think about it, the present time, when people try to make decisions and they think about what's good and right in the world, they operate kind of uh, from a, a framework that's interesting. Okay? We're not going to deal with all of these today, but we'll come back to them at different times. One of the things is that makes you, one thing that makes you very valuable and gives you a lot of power in our culture is if you're a victim. Okay, if you're a victim, then, then you, you have the trump card of all trump cards, right? No, no inference there of Donald Trump, just a trump card, right? You have the trump card of all trump cards because if you're a victim, your experience trumps everybody. You speak authoritatively within that. As a matter of fact, everybody is beholding to you because you are a victim. And once you take that as an identity, it gives you tremendous power in your relationships and tremendous power politically if you're a victim. Another one is the idea is that who you are is completely determined by who you think you are. So if somebody asks, well, who am I? Well, you know, let me, let me figure, I'm going to figure that out. As a matter of fact, we've even pushed it all the way back at the beginning. We don't want to mess people up and try to force them into something that they really aren't. We want them to let them explore it and figure it out as they grow up. So now we're having discussions, which I used to joke about 10 years ago, that, you know, when, I, when, when Jacqueline and Francesca and the girls were born, you know, we had those moments as a parent where we would go and have a sonogram, right? And we'd have a sonogram. That, oh, it's a... Girl, that's, they use that, that kind of just very terrible terminology. It's a boy, right? They actually thought that if they looked at the person's physical makeup, they could tell you something really, really important about their identity. Now, we've turned that into, we don't want to assign their identity. So don't say that now. I don't know what they're going to say. Oh, it's a human being. Oh, it's a perfectly good functioning set of cells, Right? Don't see anything here. I know what it is. But we don't want to prescribe any identity to it because its form doesn't tell us anything about who it is. That's something that we as even parents are going to wait to see them discover on the way up because who you are is who you think you are. Your body doesn't tell you anything about who you are. Society shouldn't tell you anything about who you are. And if they do try to tell you who you are, that's an act of oppression. And you need to be free from that. So that's one of the, the frame of references. So anytime we hear, right, how could we be in a culture where we could actually hold, it, it is a, a sensical way to speak about people, is that you could have a man in a woman's body. And that's an accepted kind of way of speaking today, right? Because I am who I think I am, right? So uh, identity is there. Uh, we regard any kind of sexual codes as oppressive. The only thing that's bad with any kind of teaching about sexuality and sexual expression is anybody who says that anything's off limits, right? That's the bad part about it. And so we pray, place a premium on the person's right to, uh, to construct their own identity. And so this is the issue here is that you can't tell anyone, right? We have all these phrases, don't judge me. Uh, don't tell me this, that, right? Because I get to determine who I am. There are no boundaries other than as long as I'm not a victim, a victimizer. That's why I think uh, many people think the only reason why pedophilia and being a pedophile is not accepted in our current environment because they still conceive of a pedophile as a victi victimizer. And because they are a victimizer, uh, they, they can't accept that. But on the other end, many people are worried that if we give children the power of consent, right, to go ahead and change their whole identity, to have life-changing, gender-altering surgery, how long will it be before pedophiles argue that children have consent? Then, where will we be, right? So the issue here in the moment is we have a framework that's pressed on us all the time, and it, it creates moral sensibilities in you. you. You hear somebody suffering, and you immediately want to empathize with them, and you don't think about whether or not they're processing their suffering in the right way, or whether they're wielding their suffering in an evil way, right? But we just need to empathize with what's happening here. So the light, put the life in the right framework as we live in a story where God has created us. He has prescribed to us in a loving way. He's given us a sense of who we are as men and women. We need to explore that, right? He's called us to live in a particular way. 
right? He's given us a vision for life. He's put boundaries on our sexuality. He's telling us that our minds can't be trusted to tell us who we are unless he speaks in and tells us who we are. So I'm going to come to that, right? Second thing is get your identity right. Okay, and this carries on a little bit with that, right? And this is one of the things, just a simple question, how would you introduce yourself, right? When Paul introduces himself here, he wants to introduce himself as someone who is caught up in in fulfilling God's will, okay? He understood himself to be who he was by the grace of God, right? Do you primarily see yourself, okay, now I was, I'm, asking this here, do you see yourself as someone reclaimed and restored by Christ? Is that how you think of yourself? Or do you think of yourself primarily as a grandma or a mom or as a citizen or a consumer? I mean, what what is your primary identity that shapes the expression of every other aspect of your life? Because this is what, if you are a follower of Jesus, that shapes what kind of mom you are. That shapes what kind of parent you are. That shapes what kind of spender you are and how you interact with the world. It shapes how you live out your life. Do you see yourself as his child, as his servant? Do you you wake up in a day and say, this life is not my own, right? You know, that one's not my own. It belongs to him, right? And so today, I want to consult him. I want to live for him. I want to follow him. Well, that's your identity, who you are. Now, how you live out that identity as a wife or identity as a husband or as a child in a home or as an employee, well, those are all conversations that we need to have, but our primary identity is our relationship with Christ as a creature that has been recreated in him and being brought to life. That shapes everything, right, in terms of that. Okay, third thing. Keep your purpose clear, right? Paul saw himself as someone on mission with Christ, okay? Now, Paul had a unique mission, but every believer is on mission with Christ, right? Matthew 28, okay, where he at the end there, 18, 19, and 20, right? I I want you to go into all the world. I want you to make disciples, teaching them everything I've taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age, right? Do you see yourself on mission, right, in terms of your purpose, right? You may be, right, is, uh, you may be a florist, right? You may be a musician. You may be a teacher. You may be uh, a retired person, but you see yourself as a, your life is on mission. You, you're, you're to know Christ, live for Christ, point people to Christ. That's a mission every day. And you are doing it either positively or negatively by the way you live every day, by the way you handle your worries, by where you run to when things are difficult, by whether or not you give God time to speak into your life through his word, whether you pray, right? All those things are happening every day, but you need to get your purpose clear. Really, what is life about? What am I here for, right? And I, I say this as a parent, right? It's emphasized by, by Van a, a little earlier. My, my primary mission in, in the life of my kids is to introduce them to Jesus and to grow them in a relationship to him by every way I can do that with them knowing, making a knowing assent to the gospel. I want to live before them in a way that points them to Jesus. I want to teach them about Jesus. I want to put them around people who know Jesus and their academic achievements, their material success, all those things are all secondary. And so for the purpose, right, in terms of life, we've got to get a purpose clear for Paul. I'm, I'm, I'm a servant of Christ. I've been appointed by him. I'm on mission with God, right, to do that. And then fourthly, know where you are, right? Notice this little phrase here where he says, in keeping with the promise of life. Now, this is one, uh, especially in chapter 3, Paul's going to delve into this one. But do you, do you really believe and trust God that you're in a moment where you're anticipating the fullness of everything that God's promised you? Right? And that you're in a moment where you have been saved as a follower of Christ, new life has broken in, made you a new creation, but you're waiting for the best is yet to come. Right? And so, number one, the best isn't to be had here. In the stuff that you own, in the power that you have, in the applause that you get, in the number of followers that you have, right? in everybody adoring your, your chiseled body. That's not where life is found. The best of life is found yet to come. And so I don't, I don't get caught up with people who are trying to find their significance in the way their body looks or the amount of money they have, right, in an the, the account or by how many people follow them, 
right? What I'm really concerned about is do I look like Jesus? Am I representing Jesus? Am I serving Jesus? That's really what I'm interested in, okay? And the issue here is because I know that everything won't be satisfied here. I expect adversity, right? One of the, one of the biggest lies of charlatans and false teachers is to come to Christians and say, if you're faithful and you're following Jesus, then all the, lives, all the difficulties will be removed from your life. Okay, well, they're setting you up to be disillusioned with what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus was the most uh, best God follower ever, and he was crucified and hated because we live in a world that Christ has come. He's announced and demonstrated that he's the king. He said, I've, I've opened a way for you to come under my benevolent rule, but I'm not going to fully establish my kingdom until the future. Because I want to give people opportunity to get into the kingdom. Because when I come to establish the kingdom, it'll be judgment and vindication. And we're in the time of God's patience. And so we're, we're little pockets of the kingdom to come in foreign territory. And we live in a world with disease, with sin, with craziness, right? And we struggle with our own as we grow in Christ. That's the world. And if you're not up for adversity, then you don't understand where you are in God's timeline. Now, there's all kinds of ways to process what happens. God's working to move us deeply in a closer relationship with him. He's sometimes going to take us into adversity so that we can be a powerful voice for the gospel because the only way someone would be faithful there to God is because there has to be some deep, powerful power here for them to hold on to Jesus in the face of all that mess. Because God says, my power is demonstrated in your weakness. So sometimes God's going to take us into a place of weakness so that we can be a powerful platform like Johnny Erickson Tata in a place where everybody else would say, man, there's got to be something going on in her life, right? So now God's on, on a mission, but we need to know where we are. And if you think that, if you check all the boxes, you show up on Sunday every time, you read your Bible every day, right? Read your Bible and everything happens well, right? then you don't, you're naive about the nature of the Christian life. You're, first of all, you're just naive about the propensity in your own soul to go dark. I just talking on Friday with some friends, and we had that there, and you know, all of us know certain key figures in recent times who didn't stay on path, who faltered. And they've caused many, many believers who've heard about their story to get weak knees too. Like, man, I, that person was so important in my faith, and I thought they were unstoppable, and what happened to them? How did they let that creep into their life? How did they let it become something that eventually just ripped the foundations out from under them? So know where you are, right? You're, today, you're not in neutral territory. Right? So the porters, and I love the porters, today, the evil one wants to destroy their marriage. Today. He wants to turn a little nick into a gash and break them apart, right? The evil one is at work, right, in us, and we're naive to think we can just trip through the day and not be impacted. And then finally, we need to draw on the right resources. And so this one is here when Paul prays at the end, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To live this life out in this frame where God is at work and God is reaching in and he has redeemed and reclaimed you how do you live out that life? What kind of resources you need? Well, you can go on to any kind of app and you can find any kind of resource that you want to try to get the best body you can have or to be the most healthy person you can have. You can go on there and get all kinds of tips about how to have the best business. And I'm not saying these things are bad in and of themselves. But is that really the resource that you need? You know, resources on how to keep a positive attitude. Well, those are, those are not bad, right? There's all kinds of little tips that people can have, right, about how to get through life. But what, what, what Paul is saying here is that you need resources that come from outside of yourself and outside of anything that any human being can give you. You need divine resources. So Timothy, if Timothy is going to survive and stay faithful to his mission and not capitulate to the other people who are abandoning the gospel, Timothy, you need grace. So I'm asking God will, will dispense his saving favor to you to resource you today right? To get you to stand strong. Timothy, be strong in the grace, chapter 2, verse 1. So you need, you need an infusion of God's grace, a sense of the fact that you have been graced, that you have been forgiven, and a confidence in a God who can save a rebel, can sustain you in faithfulness. 
You need mercy. Mercy is always compassion. You need God's compassion to be extended toward you today in your suffering. When, 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 God, when Paul prays for compassion, as does the New Testament, it assumes suffering, and it assumes God stepping in with concrete resources to help you face a disease, to help you face chaos in your relationships, to help you face unemployment, to help you face dealing with dark memories from the past. You need mercy, and we need to be praying for mercy for each other so that we don't give in to the darkness within. And then he says, lastly, peace right? That you can come to this place where God can use these resources so that you can have a sense of, it is well with my soul. Where everybody else is looking like that person, I don't know how they're still standing, let alone still smiling. It gives you an inner wholeness, right? And that doesn't mean I don't cry. It doesn't mean I don't jump up and down and cheer. It doesn't mean I don't get angry. I think angry uh, anger in the right way is a godly response to many things. It doesn't mean any of those things, but it means all of those emotions are tethered to a deep confidence in a God who's big enough for whatever problem I'm in. A God that I need to hang with him if I'm going to get through it. A God who says, it's not always going to be this way. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to redeem it all. I'm going to hold on to him, but I need resources from him to do that today. You can't be the mom with your toddlers that you need to be without the grace of God, okay? You cannot be the husband that you need to be, the wife you need to be. You can't get along with each other in this church that you need to be without divine help, right? You certainly can't care for people who hate you without divine help, right? And so put life in the right frame, God's at work, create. get your identity right. Who are you? And uh, I'm going to give you this in a moment, but then keep your purpose clear, know where you are and draw on the right resources, right? And so here, right at the end of this book is the testimony that I hope by God's grace, I can say at the end of my life, right? Paul is not touting his own abilities, and by the grace of God, I can say this because by the grace of God, I am who I am. That's what he said in 1 Corinthians 15. But here's what he says, right, as he's encouraging Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who have longed for his appearing. Right? So we're people of longing, right? We cry. We work hard. Paul often uses this phrase, suffer together with me in the gospel. Work hard. We know joy. We know depth of relationships like fathers and sons. We know purpose and meaning. We know who we are. Right? And if we forget those, we'll get stopped. We'll get stopped. Right? Now, here's my little assignment to you. Today, right? If you need some help, I'd go to do Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. And as you read and study and think over time, write out a portrait of who you are from Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. That's who you are if you know Jesus. Right? Write it out. You're, you're adopted. You're, you've been brought into a relationship of love. You're a part of a God who's bringing all things to uh, fruition. He is in control of everything. So you need not worry that there's something that's fallen outside of his control that may take you over. No, no. That's the God that you know. And then help ask God to help you to live into that identity. Okay. Let's, would you just stand with me? We're going to pray together and then I'm going to dismiss you today. And uh, I, I want to I encourage us all as we work through this, right, through the next couple of months, Here's something I'm certain about. The evil one will be at work to try to do all kinds of things to knock you off your feet. And some of you right now are struggling to stay on your feet. And one of the things we're going to find out here is that, as we had with Jasmine today, one of the primary means that God gives to us to sustain our faithfulness to him is each other. So I'm gonna, I want you to pray and be aware of the type of dynamics that are going on in our body, 
Because God wants you to represent his care, his compassion, his sustaining grace by being Jesus in concrete form to one another. All right? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies today. Thank you for everything that you've given us. Lord, we, uh, we pray. Lord, you know. Lord, even as we sang today, we are prone to wander. And Lord, sometimes we, we wander because things are going well. And then we get full of ourselves and think that, that we're, we're responsible for our own success. Lord, sometimes we wander in our pain and our suffering because we wonder if you're there, if you care for us, if your promises are secure. And so, Lord, I pray, Lord, for us, Lord, please, would you open the eyes of our heart to recognize what it means that you have set your affection on us. Lord, would you please tether our hearts to you? Would you, Lord, awe us with the fact that, Lord, you have set your favor on us and you have provided for us everything that we need today for life. Lord, you've given us everything that we need to face the darkest things that face us with hope, with purpose. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, today to lean in. Lord, I pray for your protection, Lord, and, and not that we are safe from life's difficulties, but that we are safe from being unfaithful in the midst of life's difficulties. So Lord, protect us, guard us, we pray. And so we commit ourselves to you, and we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.